Aloha. Today we have a guy that says he's going to apologize. I don't know why. He says he's a Catholic apologist. I don't know why he would do that. No, we have Carlo Broussard returning. We very rare have, rarely have returning guests who's a Catholic apologist. And we're going to be talking about his book, Meeting the Protestant Challenge. And, and they do challenge us in so many ways. Uh, we look at our, our Protestant brothers and sisters, and so many of them have such a beautiful, deep walk with the Lord. And yet there's uh, such a confusion. We, we don't communicate. We, we misuse terminology. And so often uh, Protestants will, will say, well, Catholics believe this. And we go, well, no, we don't. Well, then Catholics believe that. No, we don't. In fact, if we believe most of what Protestants say we believe, we probably wouldn't be Catholic either. And yet there are some things that I think because we're Catholic and we, are from, we have the fullness of faith, we maybe can shed some light for our Protestant brothers and sisters and share with some, uh, some of the deeper uh, parts of our faith. And we'd love to do that today. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be back with our guest, Carlo Broussard. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Today we had, uh, you know, every morning I do an ocean sunrise catechism. In fact, we're going through uh, the catechism for the second time now. We've done, we went through it for a three-year period. Every morning at around 7 a.m. Bear Wozniak time. So uh, whether I'm in Hawaii or maybe I'm overseas or maybe on the East Coast, it's whatever time 7 a.m. is for me. Uh, we go through the catechism. And today I was really struck. We're in the part of the catechism paragraph 218, uh, where we're talking about who God is. And we know God's name, Yahweh, means I am who am. In other words, I am existence. Nothing has existence except from God. God is existence. But also his name can mean I am who I am. In other words, God is essence. And we're learning here that God is, lo God is truth. And we're also lear learning that God is love. You know, it's the two wings uh, of the eagle. You need both. If, you, if you, all you have is truth and you don't have love, Oh, it's, it's horrible. But if all you have is warm, gushy feelings and you don't have truth, uh, it can be just total confusion. So we need both. But I was thinking, how can God be a God of love? You know, before he created anything, how could it be said that God is love? It's because from the beginning, from, from eternity, which isn't the beginning time, it's outside of time and space, God the Father, who always, always is a father, always was a father, eternally begot his son, Jesus, who he loved. And who loved him? There's nothing more beautiful than a love for a father, for a son, and a son for a father. And then the early church father said that the love between them is the Holy Spirit. So uh, when we say God is love, yes, before he made any created being, God is love. And we're invited. Have you ever experienced God's love? Have you ever actually felt the infusion of God's love? I have. And it changed my life when I was 19 baptized in the Holy Spirit, and God's love just poured into me like liquid, hot love. And I felt forgiveness, and I felt power, and I felt mission. And from that moment, I've been pretty obnoxious because everywhere I go, I want to share with people the good news. My life changed forever. But let me just read this to you. God is love. For Israel is compared to a father's love for his son. His love for his people is strong than a mother's love for her children. God loves his people more than a bridegroom his beloved. His love will be, be victorious over even the worst infidelities and will extend to his most gracious gift. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God is love and he's knocking on your door asking you to invite him in. He's not, he's not going to come in unless you invite him. But you can stop right now and say, Jesus, I want to surrender all my life to you. Let me know you. Forgive me my sins that come into my life. And then let that happen. And then go to, go to your Catholic priest and go and renew your sacraments or visit about what it, what it means to be a Catholic. We're talking with Carlo Broussard today, who has a great love for the church and uh, has written a book called Meeting the Protestant Challenge. So it's going to be very, very, uh, very uh, good to have you back on the show, Carlo. Aloha. Hey, Berg. Thanks for having me back, brother. Aloha to you. <laughs> hey, can you give us a little backstory first about your faith walk, how you came to this point? 
Yeah, so I come from a music background in southern Louisiana, playing the Cajun accordion from the time I was 13, playing in the bars, um, and pursued a musical career in Cajun music in southern Louisiana all the way until I was 20. So I recorded my first album about 13, recorded a second album when I was 16, started playing the nightclub circuit about 17 in order to appeal to sort of a younger generation, a younger crowd, right? Because initially I started playing the old folk type Cajun music, just an accordion and a fiddle type thing, you know? Um, And if you don't know, if your listeners and viewers don't know what Cajun music is and what a Cajun accordion is, they can just Google it, right? I I can tell you, when I I was bicycling across the United States, I was getting close to Louisiana. Oh, yeah. Uh, And I picked up a Cajun DVD because I was using a DVD. This is 20 years ago. Man, that music carried me all the way to Florida. That's just, you know, it just gets you the yeah, cadence get, of it, everything it just gets, gets you going. going, brother. You yeah. can't help but not yeah. tap your foot whenever yeah, it. And then you get that Cajun mixed in with a little rock, and it's just like, that's it's, right. It's so. And that's cool. what we did. That's when I was about 17, we started playing the nightclub circuit. We had a mixture of Cajun music, but with rock and roll. And if your viewers are familiar with Zydeco, uh, we did some Zydeco music as well. And so I was pursuing that career. And when I was about 20, I had some of the best of the best musicians in Southern Louisiana, and we were ready to cut a third album. And the week before our studio session, I called it off and got out of music entirely and gave up my dream to be a full-time musician and play Cajun music uh, around the country because I had opportunities to do that and even possibly the world. But the reason why I gave it up, Bear, was because I encountered the Lord I encountered Jesus about two years prior to that, right around 17, half 18, something like that. Uh, But what really sparked my conviction for Jesus and for the Catholic faith was I heard the conversion story of my now boss, Tim Staples. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so when I heard his conversion story for the first time, Bear, I was introduced to what we call apologetics, which is basically the study of defending a position. But mm. particularly, so you're not for apologizing us, for anything. Okay. That's right. Now I'm not going I around get it. saying I'm sorry that I'm Catholic. <laughs> I'm defending yeah. the idea of why I'm Catholic, yeah. right? Right. And so it, that just comes from the ancient Greek word apologia, which means, you know, the, to give an intellectual persuasive p- uh, explanation for one's position. Right. Well, there was a was there a conviction that you came to, but was there also an, a, a, a personal relationship that that um, can yeah, you tell well, us that, about that? That developed. So for me mm. in my walk, it wasn't an emotional encounter. And in, well, I, I, let me back up. When I was a kid, when I was about 10, 11 years old. I did have some powerful religious experiences with the Lord. My mom was a devoted Catholic, and she, man, she was just pedal to the metal Catholic, right? You know, led the youth group, the choir, all of this stuff. Took us to World Youth Day when I was 11 years old in 1995. And so she would always take us to these youth 2000 retreats which had our lord in his eucharistic presence at the center of the retreat with thousands of teens you know and i had some profound religious experiences of our lord uh, present in the eucharist and sort of that catholic community what do you mean by a profound experience no one's ever it's for some people i know it used to be me it was like from the outside looking in what do you mean by a profound experience how does well, that happen? How does a door yeah. open like that? Yeah, well, as you mentioned in sort of the opening of your show, Bear, sort of that warm infusion of God's love, right? I mean, I guess we could say a fuzzy wuzzy feeling. <laughs> but but it but was it, the, it, it, it wasn't like the feeling you would get like I was thinking is when I gave my life to the Lord and they were gonna pray for me, I thought, well, is it gonna be like, hey, maybe it's gonna feel like I asked a girl out and, and she said yes. It wasn't anything. It's it was totally cosmic and <laughs> it was cold you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, just in, in, in the midst of being in the presence of our Lord and yeah. praise and worship and having that sense that God is there and that he is mm. present, and that he loves me mm. and sort of that overwhelming feeling that you can only respond. The human response can only be in tears, right? Where you begin Amen. sobbing and weeping, you, you, you feel his presence. Now, I was only 10 or 11, but so the, it wasn't like I had some past the, life of but, horrific sin. But that, that's, but not, a, that, that's not emotionalism. No, 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 no. That's God's love. Nothing hyped you up for that. It was unexpected. 
Sure, sure. And then, then there's that infusion of love. But I remember when that happened to me, Carlo, I was like, Car- I was like, I also had a knower in me that knew. Yeah. I knew his love, but I knew I knew he was truth. Right. You know, it's love and truth. God is love. God is truth. Yeah. Yeah. So you began from that point of experiences of love, and then what happened? Yeah, so that religious sense was implanted at a young age due to my, the witness of my mother and these profound experiences with our Lord and the Eucharist at retreats and stuff. And then, of course, that religious sense got eclipsed a bit as I began playing in the nightclubs uh, when I was 17 or so because, you know, as you know, Bear, in the nightclubs, it's not that great of an environment. A lot of immorality goes on. And so that religious sense began to be eclipsed. I was never like really horrifically bad, right? But interiorly, I was beginning to become corrupted. My heart was being directed away from our Lord. And so it it wasn't until I heard that conversion story of Tim Staples where I was introduced to this thing called apologetics, right? And defending the faith. And for some reason, Bear, that was very appealing to me which was interesting because I wasn't an intellectual guy. Like I wasn't an intellectual teenager. I wasn't inquisitive, asking big questions and stuff like that. I was just concerned about doing my music thing. Well, we know, we know like Father Robert Spitzer talks about this and Thomas Aquinas talks about this. There's a love for truth innate with humans. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and we, that was awakened within me. Yeah, there's this desire for truth. Like even a liar doesn't like to be lied to, you know? Yeah. And we want to know, well, what, what makes that that the sun come up in the morning, you know, we, yeah. there's a desire for truth, but then you, but then there's this deeper, deeper desire to know the truth about God. We're talking with Carlo Broussard. When we get back, we're really going to dig into his new book, Meeting the Protestant Challenge, um, and uh, dig a little bit deeper into his encounter, his growth in the Lord when he heard the, the testimony of Tim Staples of C- Catholic Answers, right? Am I that's right, right, yeah. You know, when we did our ride on, on season one of Long Ride Home, we ended it at Catholic Answers. I remember when you came to the office there. That was so there. cool. That was so cool. Yeah. Carlo, uh, oh, yeah, that's right. Carlo, we'll be right back. This is the Bear okay. Wozniak Adventure. we talking with Carlo Broussard with Catholic Answers. That's right. I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Plus, good stuff happens when you support us at patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure. You get instant access to every radio show, Bear Wozniak Adventure, and our TV episodes, Long Ride Home, the instant we produce them, months before they even air. Plus, we give you all kinds of free stuff, coffee cups, t-shirts, and other things like that. Go to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure and become our patron. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that bell. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, this is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. My son, Shane Wozniak, is the producer of this show. He just shouted in my ear, a wonderful show. He remembers being there at the Catholic Answers with you, too. So, oh, awesome. um, so he's really enjoying this. But now let's go deeper. Tell us now about that moment when you, your, your heart opened, I want to know truth, and just l- let us know how that progression in, yeah, so like I, like I mentioned, I was introduced to this thing called apologetics, and that sparked an interest in me. So I got a hold to some of the other tape sets at the time. Yes, I was listening to tape sets in the, the cassette tape deck. Right? Lisa wasn't. Uh, Lisa wasn't eight, tw- eight track tapes. I know, right, right, right. I'm not quite as dated here as you, Bear. Yeah, right. <laughs> But uh, we, we actually had CDs at the time as well. Anyway, so I started listening to more of Tim Staples' teachings. And as I started listening, through that knowledge bear, I increased in conviction and in love for Jesus and for the Catholic faith. And that's when the Lord lit the fire within my heart 
And man, it was a blazing. And so I just couldn't get enough of theology and studying the Bible and studying theology and sharing the faith. And so when I was 18, my, I actually joined a retreat team with my sister. And my sister was head of a retreat team. We went to different parishes conducting retreats for confirmation classes. Mm. And so I was, I, I was able to do some ministry there. And I got my first experience of giving talks and all of that stuff and using some of the apologetics and helping some of the teenagers out. And so that's where that love for the Lord began to grow and increase. And the more I studied, the more convicted I got in my faith. But what happened, Bear, was that I came to a crossroads, brother, Mm. because at the time from 18 to 20, when I'm growing in love for Jesus and for the Catholic faith, I was still pursuing my music career on the nightclub circuit. And so a contradiction, I was experiencing a contradiction within my life to where I was in hell on Saturday and in heaven on Sunday, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, preaching to those teenagers, you know, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, drunkards won't enter the kingdom of God, right? Yeah, there you are. (laughs) But but here I am on Saturdays encouraging people to get drunk in the bars and the nightclubs because the drunker they got, the better we sounded, right? Like for me, Carl, I got to (laughs) nightclubs just were torture for me. Never, never want to go to one, never liked to go in, but I became, you know, really baptized in the spirit at the age of 19. But I remember there was a nightclub when I went to Baylor called The Shadows. And I had Christian friends that would go there. And I yeah. would tell them, you know, I, the Lord would just say, I remember I told this, I forget how this came out exactly, but it was like I told this one guy, you got to come out of the shadows. Yeah. Ooh, and he goes, yeah. yeah, I've been going to this club called The Shadows. And I go, no, I mean, <laughs> you gotta, but it was like the Holy Spirit convicted him because that's exactly Amen. what he needed to hear. A lot of and people that's what do happened that. to me. Yeah, yeah. You, it's not. I mean, it's not not the worst thing in the world, maybe to go to to go to a club, but um, but it can grieve the Holy Spirit within you too. Yes, uh, and that's what that that's there. what was happening for me. And the Lord was convicting me. I was realizing that I, if I wanted to be a man of God and to pursue holiness, right, then I could not continue down this road playing the nightclub circuit. Because if I was going to pursue music as a career. It's just I was going to have to play the nightclub circuit in order to make it. Mm. And so I came to a crossroads and eventually I made that decision to give up my music career in the pursuit thereof and to begin pursuing a newfound dream, Mm -hmm. this newfound dream to do apologetics, study theology, philosophy, teach and all of that. So I gave up my music career. But Do you feel like you gave up anything or was it the pearl of great price that you were so excited about? Oh, sure. Well, I mean, I, I, tur- I turned my back on a career of mm-hmm. pursuing music, right? Mm-hmm. But, of course, in no way was there a void in my heart. My, for- my heart was entirely full with the, love, with, the, with the love for Christ and a conviction for the faith. So there was nothing lacking, right? Right. So I did have to say no to something, but that was because of my yes to Jesus. Yeah, there's a lot of the single yes. The thing about the yes to the Lord is it simplifies your life so much. Amen, it does. You don't have to be clever. You don't have to try to figure things out. There's so many things that you can just, you just very easily say no to That's because right. of the yes to Jesus. It doesn't give you, it doesn't mean you won't have adversity, but it's all for the right reason, you know? Amen, and that adversity can be properly ordered to a higher good, you know? Praise That's God. the adventure. That's your great adventure, you know? You bet. And so tell us then, as you, you begin to pursue apologetics and, and, uh, and I want to get into this book eventually, but you lead us into that. Yeah. So I gave up the music career and said, okay, Lord, I'm yours and I'd like to do theology. So you just lead the way. And I must say, you know, for the next 15 years, step by step, the Lord provided for me the opportunities to work in ministry. So I attended a undergraduate Catholic Institute in Corpus Christi, Texas, uh, a couple of years of junior college, you know, down in Louisiana and doing ministry there. I was a student resident at a Catholic center and kind of doing the the ministry thing, you know, still. Um, And then I went off to college to study theology. And that's where I met my wife in Corpus Christi, Texas. And I was there for a year, came back to Louisiana. We started our family here. And I pretty much immediately started working uh, for my pastor down in Louisiana at a parish, little little parish in southern, in southern Louisiana, Crowley, where I grew up, Immaculate Heart of Mary. And I was doing ministry there, so working for my pastor full time. We also had an elementary school, so I taught seventh and eighth grade theology. And in the course of working for my pastor, I completed my undergraduate studies in theology. 
And then I would also complete my master's in theology via distance education through the Augustan Institute. After that, we moved to Washington State. I did ministry there for four years, two of which I worked for Father Robert Spitzer in the Magis Center. Oh, my and, God. I mean, I love, yeah. you know, I got to have a cigar with Father Robert, you know, <laughs> one of the nap. Sat down, he said, I gave him one, gave him a cigar. He sat down right next to me for an hour. You know, that cigar is an hour smoke. But I remember I told him, I really like your, your four, it was a, Four book series. I think now it's a five book series. Yeah, something uh, like basically that. Basically, yeah. Upward Yearning of Man. Like, I really like That's your right. books. And he goes, Oh, yeah. Then he started asking me questions. Well, what did you- he started asking me questions out of his books? You know, like, <laughs> oh. but luckily, I was, it was fresh in did my you mind. Really you know? read it? But yeah, I really did read it. I wasn't just, you know, like, I really love In fact, our, our series that we shot in, in, in Hawaii for Long Ride Home is all based on his, his books. Beautiful. Uh, Man's beautiful. Upward Yearning. Yeah, beautiful. That's the word for Hawaii and the beauty yeah, that's been part of our that. soul. So yeah, you got so to work. To work with, so you had him. to work with yeah. Father Robert Spitzer. You poor guy, yeah. man. You are one blessed guy. I am. I am. The Lord was very generous to me, man. You know, just his his grace in allowing me those opportunities to do that. So after that four years of being in, in Washington State and working with Father Robert Spitzer, uh, that's when four years ago uh, I got a text from Tim Staples. And in the meantime, Bear, for the fifteen years when I was pursuing theology and whatnot. I was always in contact with Tim Staples and he befriended me and he was pulling me along the rope and directing me and saying, one day we'll work together. One day we'll work together. Just keep, keep, keep pursuing, you know? And so I kept trusting in the Lord and I got the text finally uh, from Tim Staples saying, okay, it's time. And so we started the process of the, the uh, interviews and all of that fun stuff. And four years ago, this past October, uh, I came on with Catholic Answers as a full-time apologist and speaker. So now wow. we have, uh, now I have a couple of books under my belt, and working on a third book, and just traveling the country, you know, speaking, one doing of my the goal, radio, one of, and all of that stuff. One of my goals, you know, I have this big library of books, and I just, you know, as many as I've read, the reading stack gets bigger. You know, amen to that. But one of my goals, actually, I've got it written down, is to order every book Catholic Answers every print, ever printed. There you go, read man. through all that's, of them, man. That's the thing about thing Catholic Answers that I love is that you um, you do a beautiful job of of going to Scripture, right? You know, because so often our Protestant brothers and sisters they'll proof text. They'll say, "Well, this Scripture says this," and um, because of the 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 um, the false understanding of solo scriptura, you know, the, 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 it, it, that's where they're coming from. The only in only Scriptures, all I want, right. no no sacred tradition. Um, and so you really need to bridge that gap from that place right. um, to, to go to Scripture, to build that bridge so that we can communicate and say, this is what we believe. This is, this is different than how you believe and why. And, and to do it in a very agreeable way. Sure. You know? um, but but you, have to, you have to be steeped in Scripture, uh, not, just, not just philosophy and tradition, but you have to really all you can do is come to them with a point of view of Scripture. And so you guys do an incredible job of that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know, the whole modern apologetics movement started by our founder here at Catholic Answers, Carl Keating, in the late 80s, was centered around that fundamental question of where's that in the Bible? And yeah. centered on the Catholic Protestant conversation and the Catholic trying to meet that challenge, you know, of providing mm-hmm. biblical evidence in order to satisfy the Protestant inquirer, right? Right. Well, there's actually another the interesting thing about that challenge bear is that as a catholic we're not required to meet that challenge because it operates on sola scriptura we can simply say well i don't need to provide a biblical passage for this belief because we don't need to have it in sacred scripture we have it on sacred tradition or the church teaches it right right that's not going to be satisfying for a protestant but at least it's coherent on the catholic worldview but there's actually another form of a protestant challenge and it's this how can the church teach X, fill in the blank, when the Bible says Y. And this is a unique challenge in this distinct because it's a charge of incoherence. It's saying, hey, look, you believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, Mr. Catholic, but yet you believe this over here that seems to contradict what you believe to be the Bible in the in, in inspired word of God. And that's a challenge, Bear, that we have to meet as Catholics because Absolutely. if we don't believe anything, we at least can't contradict sacred scripture. Of course, because you know, and the, so the Catholic... I address fifty of those in my book. Okay, we're going to dig into that in a second. But you know, the thing is, is uh, the Catholic Church brought the, gave us the Bible. You know, the, we're the ones right. that discerned the, the table of contents anyway. And of course, we believe it's the inspired Word of God. But where there seems to be uh, an incoherence, 
that tends to be where the richness comes out. Yes, indeed. You Whenever know? you begin to to meet these challenges and yes. show that the belief coheres with the scripture. That's text. where the depth comes through. Sure. We're talking with Carla Broussard. Broussard. Love that Cajun sound to that name. Uh, he's uh, uh, an apologist with, with Catholic Answers. His new book, "Meeting the Protestant Challenge." Does that means we want to confront or or argue? No, we want to. There, 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 there's a challenge there that we need to be. They're asking us. We want to dialogue. We want to communicate with them, and have a, 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 a eyeball to eyeball, heart to heart exchange. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be right back. Hey, man. I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I invite, want to invite you again. If you go to Facebook and you uh, seek out uh, the, the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure uh, fan page uh, and, and like it and follow us, then every morning you're going to get a little prompt that our Ocean Sunrise Catechism is starting. And we love, we go through the whole catechism from the beginning all the way through. This is our second journey through the catechism. I don't know anybody that really does that. We go through the whole catechism. And guess what? It's called the Ocean Sunrise Catechism for a reason. Because the ocean is usually behind me and the sun is rising behind me most times. So it's a beautiful time we have together. And the people who participate in it, every day we open up a common thread. And people can dialogue and ask questions through the Facebook comment screen. And they talk with each other. And we've really become like an ohana, as we say. So uh, join us for the Ocean Sunrise Catechism. You can go to fa Facebook uh, and, uh, and friend us on the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure page. We're with us today, Carlo Broussard. Uh, we very rarely have guests back, but I knew I needed Carlo back in here. He's written a new, new book, Meeting the Protestant Challenge. Can you tell us, Car Carlo, just start lifting out one subject at a time of areas uh, of conversation that we need to have? Yeah, so what I do in my new book is I divide the challenges or I categorize the challenges into eight different topics. Uh, so challenges that our Protestant brothers and sisters will pose to us. Uh, concerning, for example, church hierarchy and the visible nature of the church, right, and the papacy. So our Protestant friends will say, for example, well, how can Peter be the rock, right, as we say as Catholics, or the foundation of the church, when St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.11 that Jesus is the foundation. So on the surface, it would seem that our belief that Peter is the foundation of the church here on earth would contradicts that passage in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Uh, also, too, we, I, I, meet, I teach you how to meet challenges concerning the church's belief about the relationship well, with Scripture let's and go tradition. Let's go back to that one. I want to, let's, okay. let's hang out a little bit there. You know, my wife, my beautiful wife, Cindy, when we went to Israel, she'd never been before, neither had I, and she was really hoping to have a personal encounter with the Lord there. And it happened to her the most unexpected places. At that time, we were engaged, and she hadn't become Catholic yet. She was on her way. It was at the primacy of Peter, mm. where Jesus said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. It was in that room mm. when the experience that we talked about in the first segment, when her soul was just flooded with God's love. Wow. So much so that she really can't talk about it. When she starts talking about it, she, she can't. Yeah. And it, it was so it was at that significant moment, Jesus inviting her not only to him in a personal way, but to his church. Right. The primacy of Peter. Jesus Amen. said, Jesus was technon, right? He's a builder. He's not a carpenter. He's maybe maybe did carpentry, but technon means builder. He, he worked with rock. If you've been to right. Israel, you know it's all rock. There's only one home made out of wood and that's the prime minister's home right so <laughs> so um so he was strong dude but yeah. he knew how to build and he said you are peter upon this rock i'll build my church and then but there's that tension with the other verse that says jesus is the is the cornerstone yeah so, yeah, yeah. D d dig into that we could yeah, spend so, hours just talking about that amen so what i do in this particular chapter in my book is i, I what i point out is that listen we got to understand that metaphors or symbols can be used in a variety of ways in the Bible. So take what you brought up, Bear, the idea that Jesus is the builder. He's the one building his church, right? 
But yet St. Paul, in that very same passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 10, Paul speaks of those who build upon the foundation of Jesus. So there are some who are building the church. Well, wait a minute. I thought Jesus is the one building the church. Mm. Is there a contradiction here? Of course not, right? Because the metaphor can be used in a variety of ways. Just because Jesus is the builder, that doesn't mean others can, can't be builders, right? Mm. We can build up the church in as much as we build with in and through Christ. Similarly, just because Jesus is the one foundation of his church, ultimately speaking, that doesn't mean Peter can't be the foundation of his church here on earth, right? So we can understand that the metaphor can be used in different ways. Take, for example, Scripture speaks of, you know, Jesus being the light of the world in John 9, 5. But yet, we're all the light of the world in Matthew 5, 14. And the, re the way we can explain this is that we participate in Christ. So Peter's right and that he is foundation of the church is not apart from Jesus, but it's in and through Jesus. Jesus grafts Peter into himself, right? And that Peter is the visible representative of Christ. So that he's the foundation of Jesus' church on earth is not to take away from Jesus being the ultimate foundation, but it's because Christ appoints him to be that visible foundation. The, the, same, the, the, the same guy that denied Christ, I mean, I, I walked in Israel in the early morning hours down the Via de la Rosa. I heard roosters crowing. Mm. His betrayal of Jesus was, I think, equal or almost as bad as Judas's. Yeah. Except for that he found, he found repentance and he, found, and he sought out mercy. We're not saying Peter's perfect. No, nope. but Peter, but Peter is the is is the is that imperfect vessel that Jesus said, "I'm going to build upon you." Explain to us this ancient uh, uh, communication of Jesus of the binding and loosing authorities and the keys to the kingdom. Where do we yeah. find that in the Old Testament? Yes, yeah, so as the keys of the kingdom that Jesus speaks of in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, when he tells Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind and loose on earth is bound and loose in heaven. The, the imagery of the keys of the kingdom harkens back to Isaiah chapter 22, verses 15 through 22, where we read about a particular office, an institutional office within the Davidic kingdom, the office of the master of the palace or the prime minister or the royal steward, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we read about how there was a wicked guy. He's replaced by another guy named Eliakim. And, and it, the whole context is all about a royal authority being given to this new royal steward. And one of the things that's given to him there that symbolizes such royal authority is the key of the house of David. And then it, it even uses the language, whatever he opens, none shall shut. Whatever he shuts, none shall open. And this was a, a ministry within the Davidic kingdom, an individual who was second to none except the king himself. So he had authority to govern the kingdom in the, in the place of the king when the king is absent and could exercise authority over the and within binding the binding and loosing authority. Yeah, as he in a sense, seal. binding and loosening. That's right. Yeah, he had the, yeah, go ahead. And so here's Jesus, the true son of David. He's restoring the, the Davidic kingdom. That's yep. the king of kings. His church is his kingdom. And what does he give to Peter? But the keys of his kingdom, thus signifying that Peter is the royal steward of Jesus's kingdom, which means he has a royal authority, second to none except the king himself, authority to govern and rule the kingdom in the place of the king with delegated authority. And then the binding and the loosing, that's actually language within the rabbinical tradition. Even in the first century of Jesus, binding and loosing signify judicial authority, right? The authority to admit somebody from the community, uh, to admit somebody into the community or to exclude someone from the community. But it also signifies doctrinal doctrinal authority as well as far as a teaching authority. don't you dig on this carlo isn't this just cool Amen it's just to that. so cool Amen. man it, you just and dig what's, a, yeah and what's really it. cool there bear yeah. is that notice jesus gives peter alone the keys of the mm -hmm. kingdom in an exclusive way and gives him an exclusive command to bind and loose mm -hmm. the other apostles do receive a command to bind and loose in matthew 18 18 but that's after Jesus gives it exclusively to Peter, suggesting that the apostles can only exercise their authority to bind and loose 
in as much as they're united to Peter. Yeah, and you look at, um, I guess, it, I'm thinking, is it St. Irenaeus of Lyon? I think about it, what, what, 150 AD or something like that. There. Justin Mortar's about 150, Irenaeus is about 180. So he's writing right there, right? He's writing against, I think, the Gnostic heresy. Yes. But I think in his writing someplace, he'll, he makes a statement that, of course, I submit all this to the to Rome, to the Bishop of Rome. Yeah, he says and, that all the churches must agree with the Church of Rome. And so that's that's ancient. And you look at even yeah. Clement's book, you know, his, or his, his letter, uh, the third, I guess the third from Peter, writing in that fatherly, uh, I believe it was, he's writing to the Philippians, he's writing in that fatherly way. Clement ref- of Rome? Yes. Yeah, he's writing to the Corinthians. Corinthians. To the Corinthians. Right, right, right. So he's writing to them and he's, he's, he's being fatherly towards them, correcting them, but yeah. in a loving fatherly way. So he had, here's a church, Corinth is in Greece, long ways away from Rome. Uh, right. And yet he's and yet he's exercising a fatherly love and care for them. There are four other patriarchies, four other major churches in the area. But it, it, it over time, more and more, we begin to understand uh, there is that there is that primacy of Peter. When when Paul had when Paul was upset with Peter because Peter was blowing it. Um, Galatians two eleven. <laughs> they went to uh, they had the, uh, the 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 first ecumenical council in Jerusalem, uh, but in the end. Um, you know, it, it was with it was with Peter being there that the final right. decision was made. We, we got to take a quick break. I'm sorry, Carlo. I'm talking All with right. Carlo Broussard, I'm digging on this conversation so much. It just tickles me, gets me deep in my gut. You know, gets a fire in the belly that I love truth and I love when you see truth unpacked and revealed like this. It just it just thrills me to be Catholic. I was with some people. Uh, in Minneapolis this last summer, and they wanted to, they were all Protestants. I was surrounded by about a dozen, and we were debating or kind of having this sort of dialogue we're having now. And finally, they said, "You know, you just have this certain thing about you really think that you really think that what you're saying is true, and you don't give us any room for for what we're saying." And, I, and, I, and they go, "That's kind of arrogant." And I go, "Well, I just believe in the teaching authority of the church." And then we started talking about that. So when we come back, let's talk about. The Teaching Authority of the Church. We're talking with Carla Broussard. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Be right back. Good stuff happens when you support us at patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure. You get instant access to every radio show, Bear Wozniak Adventure, and our TV episodes, Long Ride Home, the instant we produce them, months before they even air. Plus, we give you all kinds of free stuff, coffee cups, t-shirts, and other things like that. Go to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure and become our patron. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that bell. Men, yes, we mean you. Go to deepadventure.com and check out Bear's Man Cave, a men's only Facebook group. Join the pack with other men as they challenge and inspire one another to manly virtue. Plus, you can dialogue with us in our regular video chat meetups. Plus, get your exclusive content. Join at deepadventure.com. That's deepadventure.com. Aloha, thunder and lightning, man. So many people I know that think, you know, I'd really like to give my life to the Lord, but I promised my father, who was a Baptist minister, that, you know, I remain Baptist my whole life. Or I, I promised my mom... You know, what would she think if I became a Catholic? Hey, dude, she's in heaven right now, hopefully. And she's saying, dude, become a Catholic. I mean, I, I, they got it right, dude. Don't, you know, all, all those bets are off. Open up your heart. Listen to the truth. You know, contend with it. Wrestle with it. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 then, and then accept it if you believe it to be true. But as I was saying, Carlo Broussard, writer of the book, um, Meeting the Protestant Challenge, I was surrounded by about a dozen people. And they all had their different opinions. Mm. But if you and I were sitting there, we would have the same thought. Because we, it's not because I just, okay, the catechism says this and I just believe it hook, line, and sinker. It's because we've become convinced that this teaching authority, whenever I have a question, I start digging into it, I got to go, uh huh, yeah, I guess that's right. And then you yeah. flip pages and what does that scripture verse mean? And you, oh, uh, yeah, Thomas Aquinas. Yeah, that's he's a pretty smart guy, you know. <laughs> or you dig a little bit deeper and you read, oh, the encyclical of, of Humanae Vitae. Now I get it, you know. So there's something about being able to trust the teaching authority of the church. When I went to the NRB convention a little while ago, it was like every, it was th- 
10,000, I don't know how many people were there, but every booth had a different sort of theology. Mm. I don't find that when you go to the Catholic, you know, like the EWTN conferences or the, the Napa event. You and I sit down with 10 other Catholics, it's going to be the same. We might illuminate and have some depth of understanding, but it's sure. all consistent teaching. And it's just so refreshing to yeah. be able to hear Catholic teaching and not have to go, yeah, that's about 80% right, but I got to throw that 20% away, you know? Right, right. And so talk to us about that because they asked me, it was almost like they thought I was psychological, had psychological issues because I really believed that the, you know, that this was true. So right. how do we how do we have the teaching authority? Why why do we need a teaching authority first of all? Well, in order to have a principle of unity, I mean, Paul is all about in his epistles about being one in mind. Jesus prayed it himself in John seventeen, Father, that they may be one. It doesn't make sense that Jesus wouldn't give us at least the means by which we can do. Dude, he's a, he's a good builder, right? Amen. He had an Amen. architect. He had a plan. He didn't just say, here, I'm throwing all this stuff out. You guys figure it out. And you know, that was principle of unity is what we were talking about before the break, the papacy and St. Peter, right? And his successors in the bishopric of Rome. And we see this played out in the first century of the Christian church, that whenever there was a major dispute, one of the biggest disputes in the history of the church, namely, how is a man to be saved, right? Yeah. Does it have to be circumcised and hold fast to the Mosaic law in order to be saved along with belief in Jesus or is it belief in Jesus and that faith in God's grace by which we're saved? And what we discover in Acts chapter 15, Bear, is that this was a big issue. It wasn't a small thing. And even Paul and Barnabas couldn't settle the matter. So Luke tells us that in order to talk about this, they take it up to Jerusalem for the apostles to consider it. So you have the apostles and the presbyters or the elders that convene together in a council. Mm -hmm. well, and, and, in those and, days, they called them presbyters because there was still priestly stuff going on in the in the temple. So they didn't use the word priest at that time. They differentiated that's themselves. Right. Right? That's right. Good good point, Bear. The uh, presbyter is just coming from that Greek word presbyteros, which is the Greek word that's used translated in English translations as elders of the church. But we right? know that those elders were the very ones that would would uh, would be the ones that celebrated the Eucharist. That is correct. And, yeah, and anointing with bishops. oil. Right. And James they, were, they, they were what we would call priests today, but they differentiated correct. that because of the, the, the temple until 70 AD was still around that time was still. Mm. That is okay, correct. Okay. Okay. So there, there you are. Peter's messed up though too. Peter got all confused about it. That's Paul re rebuked him to his face. Well, that's actually after the council. Right. That's right. Paul, that's right. Peter wasn't confused doctrinally because mm. it's Peter who settles the debate. In Acts chapter 15, Paul, uh, excuse me, Luke tells us in verse 6 there, there was uh, no small debate. Peter stands up in verses 7 through 11, lays it down, right, and says, this is what it is. He says, we believe. It's a doctrinal de declaration. And he's not offering it as an opinion bear. He's settling the dispute. And, and so at that council, we mm. see Peter exercising his authority to bring unity in belief concerning how a man is to be saved not circumcision in the old law, but by faith in the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, Peter does mess up. In Galatians 2, Paul tells us that Peter doesn't practice what he preached, right? Because he was hanging out with some Gentile folk, eating some 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 crawfish with them, right? Peter right on. Speaking, yeah, you. <laughs> whatever. Sacrifice or not, maybe better. <laughs> and so Peter was hanging out with the Gentile folk, and you had these Jewish Christians coming over, right, from Antioch. And so Peter actually withdraws from table fellowship with these Gentiles out of fear of scandalizing the Jews, right, or like upsetting them. And Paul hammers Peter for that. But notice, Paul hammers Peter. With Peter's words. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. Paul, Paul is basically telling Peter, hey, brother, you need to live up to what you preach. And that's the beauty of it. So when, it, when, yeah. a, when a pope speaks, as we would say, ex cathedral, when he speaks from the chair of Peter, uh, we could look back through history and we can see that that's all solid teaching. But that doesn't mean they're perfect. I mean, they, they blow it morally. And I mean, I've, I'm a big student of Catholic history. Um, they, they blow it, it may blow it a hundred different ways. And even maybe their, yeah. their sermons on Sunday may be wrong but when they speak in that certain voice. But it's also the unity uh, of, of the bishops, too, uh, sure. coming together. And, and, and that there, there wasn't just Peter just saying it. 
there was a unity. The bishops came together. So from the very beginning, you see that there's a what it, a, what is it, what, what is the definition of the magisterium of the church? What do we mean when we say that? Yeah, that just comes from the Latin magister, which means teacher. So it refers to a body of teaching officials, right? And the body of teaching officials within the Christian church is the Pope and the bishops united to the Pope or in union oh. with him. Okay, now I'm going to ask you one more question because this has opened up, broken up a, a, a hearts to hear. Critical, though, soteriology, the, 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 the salvation message. Mm. How does our salvation message differ from the once saved, always saved, solo fide, you know, by faith alone? What is the Catholic understanding of, the, of, of salvation? Yeah, well, the simple message is you repent, you turn from your evil ways, and you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul said. But that belief, which is only brought about by God's grace without any sort of our cooperation, it's where God puts us in the movement, right? We're in the flow, baby, and we're on our way. And just the question is, will we respond to that grace or not? And, and so if we respond and say, yes, I believe, well, then that belief brings you to the waters of baptism initially. Because 1 Peter 3.21 says, baptism save us. St. Paul says in Romans 6, 3 through 4, we die with Christ in baptism, we rise to a newness of life. So you get baptized, you're born anew, as Jesus says in John 3, 3 through 5, you're born again, you're incorporated into the mystical body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, through that baptism. And then you must begin fostering that union and that relationship with Jesus Christ through manifesting the charity that God has poured forth into our hearts, Romans 5.5, 5, through deeds and through works and through loving our neighbor and through loving God but it, and persevering in that relationship unto the end to die in friendship with Jesus so that we may receive the eternal reward, the crown of eternal life. Well, I was on the beach the other day. We had, uh, this is a few years ago. We had a Catholic priest come down and Bless our our surfing event, and uh, there were a lot of uh, other other Christians there, and they were they were going up and down the beach witnessing, and they say, now if you ask someone, have you given your life to Jesus, and they say yes, then you can just leave them and go to the next person. There's that concept of once saved, always saved, which really doesn't exist in Scripture. No, um, but not. but there is this other extreme where we're accused as Catholics of saying you have to work your way to heaven. That's Pelagianism. So t t give give us that, give us yeah. the clarity, draw that, give us the coherence. You got a minute and a half. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to do something good without God's grace will not get you to heaven. Anything that we do that is good and it brings about the reward of eternal life can only be if it's motivated by grace, if it's moved by grace, if it's animated by charity, by love, right? So in order for us to have the reward of eternal life given to us because of works of love that we perform, it must be based on love. It must be based on charity in the soul. And so Pelagianism is saying, well, I don't need grace. I can just do something good and get to heaven. No, you need grace to move you to do that good, but on a supernatural level in order to get the reward of eternal life, which is basically a free gift because Jesus is saying, the re I'm going to give you a gift. And if you want to receive that gift, then you need to love your neighbor. <laughs> if you, you love me, if you love me, that. keep my keep my, keep my commandments. You know that's right. Martin, Martin Luther said, you know, uh, it, it's it's faith alone. But but there's a scripture verse that has that word in it, and it says it's in James. It is not by faith alone, but by works also. And so Martin Luther didn't like that. He took that book out of the Bible, and then later right. it was an appendix, and later they got back, put back in. But it is Correct. not by faith alone, but by works also. It's the both end. If you love Jesus, if it's an obedience, an obedient faith. Sure. And moving in the Lord. We're talking with Car Carlo. We're going to have you back again, bro. I really love talking with you. If you will, <laughs> you'll come you, back. Yeah. Carlo Broussard, how can they find you? It, how can they find you in your book? Yeah, they can go to shop.catholic.com to get the book, and then they can follow me at carlobroussard.com. That's a one-stop shop for all the work. But we don't know how to spell do Carlo Broussard. We don't know how to yeah, spell Carlo Yeah, I know. So that's Carlo, K-A-R-L-O. And last name, Broussard, B-R-O-U-S-S-A-R-D.com. Thank you, Carlo. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want everybody to go to our website, deepadventure.com. We got so much going on there that the webmaster's like, I've never had to design such a challenging uh, website before. Go there and get, get hooked into what we're doing at deepadventure.com as well and visit Carlo Broussard. What's your website one more time? CarloBroussard.com. How original. 
<laughs> Carlo, we look forward to seeing you again. Till next Thank time, you, Bear. may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Hey, man. I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Plus, good stuff happens when you support us at patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure. You get instant access to every radio show, Bear Wozniak Adventure, and our TV episodes, Long Ride Home, the instant we produce them, months before they even air. Plus, we give you all kinds of free stuff, coffee cups, t-shirts, and other things like that. Go to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure and become our patron. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that bell.